Hello everybody, I'm your host Hal Curtis and I'd like to welcome you to The Space Industry by SatSearch, where we share stories about the companies taking us into orbit. In this podcast, we delve into the opinions and expertise of the people behind the commercial space organisations of today who could become the household names of tomorrow. Before we get started with the episode, remember you can find out more information about the suppliers, products and innovations that are mentioned in this discussion on the global marketplace for space at satsearch.com. Hi everyone and welcome to the episode. Today I'm joined by Chad Meskimen from Redwire Space. Redwire is a space infrastructure company headquartered in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Chad is product manager of Redwire's Advanced Configurable Open System Research Network, or ACORN. And today we're going to discuss this system as well as modeling and simulation development in space missions more generally. Uh, Firstly, Chad, welcome to the podcast and thank you for being with us today. Is there anything you'd like to add to that introduction about yourself or Redwire? Hal, thanks for that introduction. Uh, And I think you covered it pretty well. Um, So we'll go ahead and uh, let's go and dive in here. Excellent. Okay. So modeling and simulation development in uh, in space missions, in system design, integration, and testing processes at all levels, it's, it's a really important part of the, the engineering practices that teams all over the world carry out. And software obviously plays a huge role in that. So in your view, what do you think are the main gaps that in modeling and software simulation capabilities particularly for new space missions today? So I think the single largest gap in modeling and simulation software capability for new space missions is the lack of standards and interoperability. Uh, There's a number of available simulation tools out there that a lot of them are tied to a specific bus configuration or flight software, um, where they only focus on a single phase of mission planning. So they're either going to help you out in that early design phase or they'll help you out in the integration phase. But at some point in the middle, you're going to have to switch tools, which requires resetting up your mission profiles, resetting up your scenarios, and it requires a lot of rework. And SATA developers in this market really need the capability to rapidly compose system of systems, pulling together disparate parts and pieces, uh, develop a solution that will meet their mission cost and schedule requirements. And, you know, that that sort of need to be able to pull in these disparate pieces and parts uh, is what makes component databases such as SAT search so important in today's environments, as they help engineers be able to identify what components are out there. Uh, but in order to truly make an informed hardware selection, you need to be able to simulate the performance of your spacecraft using these components. And then once you've been able to make that hardware selection and you've got your hardware in-house, you need to be able to evaluate the vehicle performance with that real hardware in the loop. This is one aspect that makes interoperability so important in the simulation tool, is that you want to be able to bring in these hardware components that you're, you haven't worked with before and haven't worked with in your system and be able to have them work within your simulation environment. Satellite missions are also becoming a lot more complex. Missions increasingly expanding to require constellations of ten, hundreds, and even thousands of satellites. And interoperability between components and satellites is becoming even more critical in those sorts of environments. To properly model missions on this level, simulation software has to be modular and scalable in a way that many simulation tools are not able to support. This increase in mission complexity is largely what's behind the push in industry for digital engineering. Uh, Digital engineering is a process that focuses on the cross-functional use of tools and data across the system lifecycle. The goals of digital engineering include using models to inform decision-making, providing an authoritative source of truth, establishing engineering environments that can be used across disciplines to ensure that the right data is being delivered to the right person at the right time. And so establishing standards and providing an environment where these disparate tools and components can be integrated and operated cohesively in is a critical capability for digital engineering and to extending your modeling beyond a simulation to the level of a digital twin where you really have a, a model that is fully representative of your spacecraft to the point where it behaves identically to your spacecraft, how your spacecraft is going to, going to behave in that operational environment. Having that high fidelity simulation of a satellite or a constellation that you can utilize for your specific mission throughout the system lifecycle uh, can reduce the cost and schedule while also providing higher confidence that a mission is going to perform as expected. That sort of simulation fidelity and ability to bring in all these different tools is what is needed by the new space market today. And it's where, where a lot of simulations are currently capabilities are currently falling short. Right. Interesting. So it's not necessarily a lack of ability to simulate mission critical aspects of the system. It's the overall interoperabilities and, and standards that exist, the overall environment. 
So, I mean, on that, Redwire's uh, Acorn product is has been designed to, as from my understanding, to help spacecraft manufacturers with different aspects of the simulation and the uh, the modeling that we've just discussed. And, and maybe you could dis- discuss a little bit about the the system, how how that support is given, and also the system makes a lot of use of modular open system architecture or. MOSA, MOSA, I don't know how you guys refer to that. But um, yeah, I wondered if you could explain a little bit about this as well. I want to start off by just providing a, a definition of MOSA. Yeah, so the MOSA approach is an integrated business and technology strategy that leverages standards to create freely coupled, easily severable modules for efficient systems development and support. Um, MOSA's foundation in modular design dictates the use of open standards, particularly in the form of widely accepted interfaces that are independent of specific vendors which allows for connectivity and rapid reconfiguration between these distinct elements of the systems. So MOSA, as a concept, is integral to the success of a digital engineering strategy. The ability to seamlessly add and remove tools and models and components from that digital environment is imperative in order to enable engineers across multiple disciplines um, and with differing needs to be able to utilize the same digital environment for their analysis. And this is where ACORN uh, really shines and really provides a lot of value. Um, Acorn provides MOSA capability uh, via the Acorn Bridge application. So systems that normally wouldn't be considered MOSA compliant, you can bring them together within the, in this environment. It's designed to allow these disparate assets, utilizing different communication mediums, different protocols, different schemas to be able to inter- interconnect. Assets that can be interfaced with Acorn into the simulation environment include component hardware, processors, third-party tools such as flight software, ground software, or engineering analysis tools. And, and to simplify, that's a, that's a big list there. So to simplify, I'll refer to the collection of hardware and tools that we can bring in uh, from here on as assets. So the bridge is, a, is fully configurable with the ability to ingest electronic interface control documents or EICDs for an asset and build the interface that will connect that asset into the ACORN system. Uh, this flexibility is what enables ACORN to function throughout the system lifecycle and performing simulations using tools and hardware that are of interest to engineers across multiple disciplines and really allows you to provide that foundation for that digital engineering environment. Right, excellent. That makes sense. So the simulations that can they then be performed once these the assets are integrated into the system, these simulations can be performed you know, in various ways. There's software in loop, processor in loop, hardware in loop, and, and so on. What do these approaches mean from the perspective of the utility, the operation of, of ACORN? That's a good question there. So I'll, I'll start with software in the loop. You were working on working in a fully non-constrained environment. Uh, there's no hard limits or rules that you have to follow except those that are enforced by the simulation itself. So, for example, if your battery on your spacecraft runs out during your simulation, the spacecraft can continue on as if absolutely nothing happened um, if the simulation allows it to do that. And so, you know, working within this, this fully non-constrained environment can be, can be very useful, especially in early development. When you're exploring different uh, scenarios, just wanting to evaluate overall performance, make those early design decisions. But eventually, you're going to need to start adding some constraints onto your simulation in order for it to continue to be useful. This is one of the beautiful things about the way that ACORN operates, is the way that it builds with where you are in the mission lifecycle. Uh, you can start out with a GNC-focused simulation that has just enough control to be able to verify your mission concept. And then as you verify your GNC design closes, you can start adding in your EPS system and verify that your design closes with that. And then you can add in other subsystem modeling, such as thermal modeling, comm modeling. Um, and you can use Acorn's built-in modules for those. But what we prefer to do is actually go in and interface with modeling tools that are designed for this. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Go and get, get those, those higher fidelity uh, modeling tools that represent uh, your various subsystems and tie them into your ACORN simulation environment. And another thing that you can do to improve, continue improving that fidelity is you can tie in custom component models via an API so that you can get more representative models of your actual hardware that you're using, the actual components. Uh, once you've done that, you are you know continuing to build on fidelity of, of your simulation uh, throughout the system lifecycle until it reaches that level of a, a digital, digital twin. And then at some point, you're going to want to loop in your mission flight software. And you can do that utilizing the Acorn Bridge. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. You can take that mission flight software and you can run it as a desktop application if the flight software will allow you to do that. A lot of flight software, you know, it had to run on some sort of processor. But you can bring that EDU in as well and interface that with Acorn. Um, and that's when you start talking about processor in the loop simulation. 
So with processor in the loop, you're now entering a first order constrained environment. Whereas with software in the loop, you can run so simulations as fast as they will go and generate your results very quickly. And now you have to work within the constraints of the processor and its clock. Acorn has the ability to run simulation in real time, either synchronously or asynchronously with the flight software. So this allows the engineers to evaluate the performance of the processor and the flight software in an environment that mirrors your actual operational environment. And then once you have your processor working in your operational environment, you can start adding in your hardware. And as you start to add hardware in the loop, the environment becomes increasingly more constrained. All of a sudden, your reaction will actually has limits on how fast it can spin. Your battery, if it depletes, now you have actual, your components are going to start shutting down as your battery depletes. You have sensors that are going to need ground support equipment in order to drive the, the proper response um, from the sensor. Acorn is able to provide messages to these ground support equipment that such that they can represent that simulated environment. And so that your, your sensors are is responding back with the correct telemetry that represents that environment. And so now, you know, when you've got that ground support equipment all working with Acorn, you've got your sensors all tied in, you've got your, your actuators tied in, you've got your processor and the loop tied in. Uh, now you've got a full flat sat that's being driven by a high fidelity simulation environment. And you can use that to do your final mission testing and also as a representative model during operations. So you can see, you know, what's going to be the effect of a certain command sequence if you send it up there or what is you can do troubleshooting on on orbit anomalies to figure out, you know, to help to figure out what the problem is and potentially a potential response to that. So that's kind of how Acorn is able to help across the whole system life cycle with various forms of simulation. Uh, one other thing I'd like to touch on before we, we move on uh, is scalability. Acorn has the ability to interface with other interconnected Acorn units uh, in order to model a constellation. And Acorn acts as the building block in this situation for a massive simulation involving large numbers of satellites. And it takes advantage of uh, VMs and vSphere's technology to be able to spin up Acorn's on-demand to meet your current simulation needs for your scenario. Um, the reason I wanted to touch on this here is that uh, these different Acorns that you have interfacing within this constellation environment, you can mix your uh, fidelity levels and your hardware integration levels on these different these different acorns. So you can have some acorns running low fidelity simulation of satellites that you're not really concerned with right now, but you want to make sure that you can still see them within your scenario. You can have a higher fidelity simulation on the ones that you want to focus on, and that higher fidelity simulation can be full software in the loop acting as a digital twin, or it can bring in that hardware in the loop aspect of it and still be talking to all these other software in the loop acorns within the same simulation environment. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to model different scenarios within this constellation environment using these different simulation techniques. Right. So you can iteratively simulate the constellation as a whole, even though different aspects of it may be at different stages of, of development. Interesting. And then, yeah, that's a really good explanation of the, the process that simulations will go through and how adding on these different levels, different layers of, of constraint, which obviously mirror more and more closely the operational environment. That's that's great. Thank you. So maybe then just to go a little bit further on it, I wondered if you could provide us with some examples of how Acorn has helped, you know, component or spacecraft manufacturers or uh, mission planners, some, some use cases. Yeah, so when we started developing Acorn, uh, we did a new space market survey uh, segmenting the co companies out there into four different uh, potential user groups for Acorn. Uh, we had component manufacturers, payload manufacturers, mission integrators, and value-add mission data services. And we worked to understand the, the use cases for each of these different groups. We've had success working with each of these groups, uh, but um, I'll give some examples uh, specific to component manufacturers and mission integrators here. The first uh, example we have is a component manufacturer that's based in South Africa, New Space Systems. They successfully integrated and driven their reaction wheel with Acorn. And they, we've done this multiple times with multiple different scenarios. Um, and so they've been able to really evaluate that performance of that reaction wheel in actual or many different representative environments and be able to you know, make improvements, tweaks, whatever they need to do to, to continue to improve that performance. They've also recently been working on integrating, evaluating their GPS receiver with Acorn uh, as well. And that integration is going very well. From the mission integrator standpoint, we've also worked with KISP in the UK, um, and they've successfully built a number of different DRMs across multiple different uh, mission profiles uh, within ACORN. Um, and taking that a step further, if you do a search on YouTube for Global Collaborative Space System Development, uh, you can find a really awesome video of a live demonstration we did at SmallSat last year, where we had a mission integrator at KISP operating three different satellites on different ACORN platforms. One of those ACORNs was located at KISP's facility in the UK. Uh, one of was located at our facility here in the U.S., and we had one located with NSS in South Africa. And the operator at KISP was sending commands to the different ACORNs, and you were able to see the response those ACORNs make, the satellites make in the video. 
Um, and in addition, we had the Acorn at NSS was integrate it had integrated in that NSS reaction wheel. Um, and so you can see the real live response of the wheels making to the flight software responding to the commands that the KISP operator is sending. And so what we have is a, a three continent demo demonstrating Acorn's constellation and hardware in the loop cap simulation capabilities, um, in addition to highlighting KISP mission design capability and NSS's reaction wheel. So we were really thrilled with the final result of that demonstration and how Acorn was able to empower collaboration across these globally distributed users. Excellent. Right. Well, we'll link to that uh, video in the show notes. That, that sounds really interesting and I think would be, would be really useful for people to see. So thanks for that. And so in these, these projects that we've discussed and other projects that, you, that you've worked on with the Acorn system, or um, you know, in, the, in the development of the system itself maybe, the, the, you must have come across several you know, very common major adoption barriers for teams that are building components or, or hold spacecraft in leveraging modeling and simulation tools more effectively or more widely. Maybe you could just discuss some of those briefly. Yeah, I think we touched on one of those barriers already in, in pretty good detail, which is that lack of standardization and interoperability. It's very difficult to utilize a simulation tool when it's not going to actually work with your mission profile or with your environment or with your specific spacecraft. And even just, you know, having not having the confidence that, that a simulation is going to be able to do that can be a barrier in and of itself. Whether or not it actually is going to do that, it's hard to want to shell out money for for a simulation because it does it is going to there's going to be a cost associated with it, it with, with not just purchasing but also just setting up the simulation it, it's hard to want to shell that out if you don't even know it's going to work with your with your mission and so that's that's one one common barrier um, another barrier is the learning curve that's associated with these modeling and simulation tools there these tools are by their nature uh, very complex you know we were modeling very complex systems and so you, there's going to be some complexity and there's going to be some learning curve associated with setting it up um, there's going to be some time and resources that you have to allocate in order to be able to use the simulation effectively. Uh, but the benefits that you're going to see over the full system lifecycle are well worth the cost, um, especially for, for simulation tools like Acorn that, uh, that do offer value across the full system lifecycle. This is especially true uh, if you're going to be planning on doing multiple satellites. Because once you've laid the foundation with that first satellite, your each new satellite that, develop, that you develop, you're going to benefit from the mission and cost savings the simulation provides. Just get, um, but uh, not have to have that that learning barrier. And kind of related to that learning barrier, you have an uh, issue of companies turning to simulation too late in the design process. You know, you, you still can get benefit out of simulation later in the design, design process. Um, obviously, as I said, Acorn is going to offer your benefit across the full life cycle. But your your truly your tr best benefit is going to be starting out with simulation and carrying it throughout your life cycle. And you know, especially because when you're later in the life cycle, you need more. You need more out of your simulation tool. You need your simulations to create increasing in fidelity, and that's going to increase that learning barrier that we just talked about. Because you have to be able to set up that. Set, you want to be able to set up a, a higher fidelity simulation. It takes more to be able to do that. Um, and so you're 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 spending a little bit more on that learning curve. You're getting a, a little bit less value across the life cycle. Uh, my my recommendation, if you're going to be looking to adopt, uh, if you're even thinking about adopting simulation, you're starting out in your design process. Do it, do it early. Do it as soon as you can because you're going to get the most benefit. You're going to get into be able to get into a rhythm with that that, that simulation tool. Um, and then one other adoption barrier I want to touch on is just the market awareness, not knowing what modeling and simulation tools are available out there. And so for this, I, I do want to recognize Sat Search for helping to educate the market and providing information about available tools in the database. And I also want to thank uh, thanks Sat Search and and you uh, for allowing me to participate in this podcast and get the word out about Acorn. Because I think we got a tool here that's going to be able to help a lot of different mission integrators, a lot of different mission profiles. Oh, well, that's that's great. You're more than welcome. Yes, yeah, so that's really interesting. So it's very much about those those sort of compound benefits, both in terms of the the accuracy, the fidelity, the operational you know realism of your simulation is is going to compound and get more advanced as you the earlier that you've introduced the tools, and also the efficiencies you you're able to create and sit and the time you're able to save also compounds further along the line because you've already built into the simulation earlier on the architecture, the overview of the, of the system. So, right, interesting. And just to finish up, where do you foresee the sort of this field, this open system architectures, you know, reconfigurable system design, where do you see this moving? Where do you see this going next in the next, you know, three to five years, say? That's a very good question there. Um, and before I describe the future state, let me take a moment to kind of describe some of the history of MOSA. MOSA, at its conception, was largely focused on rapid satellite development and the ability to minimize rework when reusing a spacecraft design. 
Uh, the goal was to streamline your hardware selection and make it easier to swap spacecraft components in and out so that satellite developers are not beholden to their supply chain. Uh, so if you have a, a supplier that's not going to be able to meet your mission timeline or just raise their prices or you know what have you, uh, you're not forced to go with them um, and, and take that, that cost and schedule impact to your mission. You can swap in and out components without having to do a full satellite redesign. And so, you know, that, that was kind of the focus of MOSA. And it was very much, you know, while, while we were talking about, you know, redesign, it still is very much focused on kind of one satellite at a time. And as a simulation tool based on the MOSA concept, that's kind of where ACORN started too. But, you know, while there's always going to be a niche for MOSA in the application of satellite development and hardware selection, I think where you're going to see it most rapidly grow in, in importance um, is for operations. Uh, I think that's where you're going to start to see it uh, applied more and more over the next few years. You look at, for example, what the Space Development Agency is doing with proliferated LEO and their Tranche 1 mission. They have 150 satellite constellation in LEO being developed by up to five different contractors. Um, and all these satellites need to be able to communicate with each other and they need to be able to communicate with different ground systems. When you have that sort of mission profile, having a solid foundation standards is absolutely critical to the success of your mission. And that's not going to be the only use cases that you're going to see here. We've got proliferated geo missions. You've got cislunar missions that are going to have very similar similar needs that are in the works. You know, take it a step further. You have the concept of hybrid architectures and mesh networks. You've got satellite constellations that weren't even necessarily designed together and weren't necessarily designed for the same purpose that you want to get to work together to achieve a certain on, on demand to be able to achieve certain mission needs. You know, and you want to have that sort of of capability. Standards and interoperability is absolutely critical. Um, and then you can even go an extra step on that and add in assets that aren't even spacecraft. You have, you know, you can bring in ground stations, ships, jets. Uh, there's a lot of terms that are being thrown around for that. Uh, multi-domain operations, joint all-domain operations, uh, joint all-domain command and control. Um, in the end, it's just a bunch of disparate systems that are generating a lot of data that needs to come together in, in a standardized format. Uh, so that you can do analysis, that so you can do evaluation, so you can utilize that data to make decisions. Modularity standards and interoperability are key to enabling the capability, uh, which is why I believe that's the area that most is going to make the biggest impact in the next three to five years. And uh, Redwire is a thought leader in most of technology. Um, with Acorn, we're going to be leading the charge in providing this predictive made modeling capability and digital engineering that's needed to design, integrate, and operate these next generation systems. systems. Right, fantastic. Yeah, that's that's a, a fascinating area. You think of the complexity of, of the largest scale constellation, satellite constellations, but you're still only talking about assets based in space or the ground systems that interface with them. Then if you add in, yeah, terrestrial based additional systems, other technologies, vehicles, whatever it is, you've got a whole other set of standards, issues, you know, modalities and companies, cr crucially companies and, and organizations to, to deal with. So it sounds like a really interesting area. And um, yeah, I think that's a, a really good place to finish the conversation there. I think um, really want to thank you, you know, Chad, for sharing your knowledge with us. I think our listeners will have learned loads about what goes into the a good quality, a high quality simulation at all stages of, of mission development and, and, and operation. So yeah, we appreciate you spending time with us on the space industry podcast today and would like to wish you and redwire all the best yeah thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity and uh thank you hal and to you as well great thank you and to all our listeners out there remember you can find out more about redwire's portfolio of products and services at satsearch.com uh, on the platform you can also find plenty of technical information for trade studies procurement and market assessments as well as make queries about any of the commercially available products and services that we've discussed in this and in other podcasts Thank you for listening to this episode of The Space Industry by SatSearch. I hope you enjoyed today's story about one of the companies taking us into orbit. We'll be back soon with more in-depth, behind-the-scenes insights from private space businesses. In the meantime, you can go to satsearch.com for more information on the space industry today or find us on social media if you have any questions or comments. To stay up to date, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can also get each podcast on demand on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Play Store or whichever podcast service you typically use.